everyone here this morning. I want to preach tonight a lesson from uh, our, on our theme series, and I want to talk about leaving a legacy that is inspiring and encouraging. And I hope that you'll make your plans to come back tonight. Uh, the lesson tonight will be a little different, so I hope that you'll come back uh, and engage in that with us. The Greek word for Lord is kurios. That may not mean much right now to you, but I hope by the time this lesson is over, that will mean quite a bit to you. We need to know what it means because it appears 700 times in the New Testament. It is something that we sing about often. Rye has led us this morning in songs. Many of those phrases and those verses talk about He is Lord of heaven and earth. He is the Lord of lords. And when we understand and when we're talking about that, we are talking basically about a, a person who is superior in some way. We're talking about someone who is above and who is superior. Uh, it's used it's similar in a passage like Acts 17. God who made the world and everything in it since He is Lord, kurios, of heaven and earth does not dwell in temples made with hands. I will tell you, that when I read a phrase like that that tells me that the Lord is heaven, is Lord of heaven and earth, I cannot fathom that. The, the, the realm of heaven and earth is something that I think is difficult for those of us here who live on earth. We live in an isolated place in some way, but yet he's talking about, Paul was talking about Acts 7, 17. I'm talking to you about the Lord who reigns over heaven and over earth. He, he does not dwell in temples that are made with hands. Or a passage like this in John 4 and verse 11 where Jesus and the woman at the well were having a conversation. The woman said to him, Sir, referring to Kurios, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Even this morning as I was coming in and, and uh, Brett and I were talking and Sarah Beth came in and Brett did what a good husband ought to do. He, he moved out of the aisle, moved out of the, the, the pew, and, and, and he let his wife come in. And she said, thank you, sir. Women, pay attention to that now. <laughs> and what she was saying was, thank you, Lord. In that sense, she was saying that. And so she was acknowledging something. She was acknowledging the fact that he was paying attention to her. I think that's good. And this woman here was saying the same thing. Thank you, sir, in essence. Matthew 10, 24, it's used, The disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master, kurios. Someone who is, in that sense, in that sense, who is above. Or in 1 Peter 3, 6, As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You know, us preachers like to make a big deal about this, because here is a woman who, uh, she calls her husband Lord. I don't get that much at my house, and my guess is you don't get that as much either where you live. But the point to that is, she had respect for him. And so, she called him Lord. Well, this passage in Acts 25, as, as Festus it has brought Paul before Agrippa, and as the, the transition or, or, or the exchange begins to take place, and Festus is explaining what is going on and why he has now brought, him, brought Paul to Agrippa so that he can judge him. Festus would say, I have nothing certain to write to my Lord, Kurios. That's really, we're talking about probably Nero at the time, concerning him referring to Paul. So Festus says to Agrippa, I don't have anything to write to my Lord, to Nero, about Paul. Therefore, I brought him out before you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. I need to, if, I, if I'm going to extend something to Nero, I need, it needs to say what I'm talking about. And I don't have anything to write. He, he, he's here because people have accused him and I have nothing against him. And so he uses that term here referring even to Nero or these Roman emperors that were, con that the word was commonly used. But this passage in 1 Corinthians 8, I think, is interesting, and it begins to get to a point that I want to make and stress to you this morning. Paul would say this, For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, kurios, yet for us there is one God, 
the Father of whom are all things, and we for Him, and one Lord, Kurios, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. Now this begins to show... This begins to show a clear distinction of Paul using a word that, that makes the point and well makes the point. But yet it's a word that's used of a lot of things and a lot of people. And yet Paul says here that there is one Lord, there is one kurios. And to state that in the first century in a place where the Romans held and where the Jews were prevalent, for him to say, but there is one Lord, and I know who that Lord is. Either he was crazy, or he was totally Jesus Christ was truly the Lord. And I'll tell you this, he looked crazy in terms of earthly standards. If you had been in the first century, and you had gone about crying, there is one Lord, and it's not Nero. And it's not my husband who's at home, and it's not the master who is over me. It's not any of those. There is one Lord. If you had thought that and you had identified him as Jesus, you would certainly have been thought of as crazy. Jesus had no name in essence. He had no family reputation. He had no material wealth. He had no well-known pedigree. But Paul said, as we all know, and as even Randy referred to this morning, from the Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 4, he said, There is one body, one spirit, as you were called in one hope of your calling. He says, There is one Lord. There is one kurios. One faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. When Paul said that in Ephesus, and I'm quite confident in other places, the implications of that would have been, in, in, in terms of how people would have viewed Paul, would have been really disastrous. Even today, there are implications. As we look to those who are leaders, those who have this superior position, those who, in essence, like a Nero in that day. We live in a time when elections are fairly divisive. Let me rephrase that. We live in a time when elections are completely divisive. But really, elections have always been divisive. I, I, I admire people who want to serve. We even have some among us who seek that opportunity. And I think that's great. I, uh, for, for them to be willing to do that, to serve in that capacity is a good thing. But most people do that because they feel like there is a way in which they can serve. Everyone that I've ever known whomever in my lifetime who has run for political office, specifically, for instance, the President of the United States has said, when, if I'm elected, I can make it better. And we like that. We're not going to vote for someone who says, if I'm elected, I'm going to make it worse. That's not what we do. We vote for those who we believe can turn things around. We do want difference makers. But the fact of the matter is, folks, that even those who run for political office are like the rest of us. They're flawed. They are people who are sinners. They make mistakes, and if elected, they'll make mistakes in office. But yet, our comfort is the fact that our one Lord is not flawed. Sometimes it looks like our benevolent Lord isn't reigning. Sometimes it looks like He isn't ruling, yet the New Testament says that He is. And what it says about us is this one Lord ultimately is going to fix everything that's wrong. And He's going to fix it for eternity. He's going to make everything that's been unjust, just. He's going to make everything that's been wrong, right. And yet that's who we serve. And it's not, it's not a politician who once every two or four or six years is elected says, I'm going to turn things around. They may or may not do that. But that's why our confidence is not ultimately in a person like that. Our confidence is in, as Paul says, there is one Lord. There is one ruler. There is one who is superior over all of us. But there's another way in which this term Lord is used that, that I find even more shocking. Jesus is identified with Yahweh. He is, Yahweh is the divine name, it's the Hebrew name for God. And, and, and there are many translations that use the, the term Jehovah. And, that, and that's really a way of transliterating or, or, or using other letters or another language to try to identify and say what you're trying to say. The passage like, for instance, is in Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, 
Yahweh. Our God, the Lord Yahweh is one. If you were to visit a Jewish synagogue today, and probably some of you have, they won't pronounce the name Yahweh. They say Adonai, which means Lord. They, they don't even pronounce a name. The New Testament is written in Greek, so the word Yahweh in your Bibles will probably be, it'll probably say Lord, and it will be in all caps. It will look differently than the word Lord will be used in other ways. So having said that, and, and, and noticing that Jesus, this, 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 this Lord is identified with Jehovah, as we like to say, or if you're in Hebrew, and Yahweh, Notice a passage like 1 Corinthians 1 that says this, But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Now the question becomes, who, who is the Lord here? Is it Father or is it Son? Well, I want you to notice about this that he is really paraphrasing Jeremiah 9, beginning in verse 23. He doesn't quote that. He doesn't identify that completely. But he paraphrases it, talking about the glory in the Lord here. And what he is saying is this. He is saying, Jesus is Yahweh. Now, not only is he saying that this one who has come and is among us, not only is he greater than Nero, not only is he greater than the man I, I, I'm married to, not only is he greater than my master, he is God. That's what he's saying. And he is identifying what he said about himself and about Yahweh in the Old Testament. He's, he is comparing that and saying, Jesus, the, the one we're talking about, he is Yahweh. And I don't think we can appreciate that quite as much unless we understand the distinctions and how these words are used. So when you get to a passage then like Romans 10 now notice what's said. He said that if you confess with your mouth the Lord, kurios, Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes into righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek for the same kurios. Over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord, Yahweh, will be saved. He identifies here something that I think is critically important. He is identifying Jesus and Yahweh as being one and the same in essence. When, when, when Paul makes statements like this, and, and when we understand what he is actually saying, there, there is... There is absolutely no reason for us not to understand. They wanted to kill him because he's saying, this man is God? No wonder they wanted to kill him. No wonder they wanted to kill Paul and no wonder they wanted to kill Jesus because he himself was making that claim. But I want you to notice that there, it seems to me there's a reason why Paul isn't bothered by all this. And, and, and I think this is important. He's not bothered by all this, not because he knows that they, they won't take his life. He was beaten. I mean, and all those things that are talked about in 2 Corinthians 4, beginning with about verse 8, about all those things Paul went through. All those things were a result of the fact that he was professing Jesus as Lord of heaven and earth. He was saying he is, he is God. But he was doing that, folks, because he was convinced I think this point, and I've made this point in other lessons, and I think it's a point that needs to be stressed. These men who called Jesus Lord were totally convinced that that's who he was. And one of the points for inspiration, sharing so much material with us about what they said is so that we'll believe that. So that when we're faced... And we may very well be, when we're faced with the challenge of saying, do you believe that Jesus is actually kurios? And do you believe that kurios is actually God? We would say, absolutely we do. We believe it with all of our heart. We've confessed it. You confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He is Lord of heaven and earth. That's what we do. And 20 years or so, and even further than that, an extended period of time, but 20 years after Paul was, what came on the scene saying that, he was saying that about someone 20 years earlier who had said, I am God. And the reason he did that is because he believed that. 
And so when we understand what Paul was saying that Jesus said, and Paul saying, I believe it with all of my heart. Then when we hear him say this in Philippians 2, Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is kurios. He is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. I love the statement. I, I love this passage. This, this is an allusion to Isaiah 45. And again, it identifies, I think, the idea of God or, or Jesus is Yahweh. And what I want you to notice about this is that this is not a time when Paul had to rethink his position when he was challenged by the Jews. That's not what he says. The fact of Jesus' lordship affected every part of his life. And ultimately what Paul is saying is, I have, I have exalted him. And there's going to come a point in time of those who have not exalted him, there's going to come a point in time when they will exalt him. And may I suggest that, that in a sense this is a, somewhat of a transition verse from the, from, the, from the intellectual fact and the spiritual fact that Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth, that this is where it goes beyond, well, that's just who He is. This is where it comes to, what does that mean? That this is where it changes. This is where it, it, it's, because I have confessed Him, this is where He, he becomes Lord of my life. There is a, a personal element to Jesus' Lordship. And that's what Romans 14 is going to talk about. Paul would say here, for none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. For if we live, where we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, that we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Now, I will tell you that... Some of that's a little bit hard. We, we know what he says is we, we clearly know he is the Lord of those who are dead and those who are alive. We know who's dead and we know, who, we know who are alive. But he says, Jesus is Lord, whether we are dead or alive. It seems to me what he's saying is if he is Lord of your life, it doesn't matter whether you are alive or whether you're dead. He is the Lord of your life. And he rules over us in both. Think about that. He, he, he asks us, as, as those who are living, he, he asks us to allow him to rule over us. And even in death, he rules over us. Whatever, wherever we find ourselves, those who have passed, whatever realm in which they find their, themselves, he is ruling over them. So in the, in the same sense, if we die in the Lord, it doesn't matter. If we are alive in the Lord, it doesn't matter. He rules over us in both. I want to go to a passage that may seem a little strange. It's found in Romans. But I want to read, I mean, I've got, I've got these verses on, on the screen behind me. I want to read these verses to you, and I want you to notice how, in the prepositional phrases, I want you to notice how the word of the Lord is used. Okay? I want you to notice, because this has to do with relationship. Romans 16, beginning in verse 1, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Sincrea, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and a sister in whatever business she has need of you, for indeed she has been a helper of many and of myself also. You know, there was a time I know you're going to find this hard to believe. You know, you remember those papers that you had to do in English classes, those essays or those term papers? And, and the teacher would always say, this needs to be 2,000 words. I hated it when they said it's got to be so many words. Remember how you did that? I can remember sitting there working on a paragraph, and, you know, and, and, and I'm thinking, I can, get, you know, I can get probably 100 words out of this, and I'd write it, and it'd be about 17 
Man, I'd be looking, I'd be putting all sorts of adjectives in there, and I'd be, I'd be, it was very wordy. I mean, you can imagine what, but, and then when I'd finally hit that magical 2,000 word mark, I'd think, man, this is great, I'm done. And you know, I'd be in the middle of a sentence. Sometimes I think we, when we read scripture, we look at phrases and, and, and we kind of pass over them. But, but I think it's important for us to, to notice every word these men wrote, guided by the Holy Spirit, meant something. Look at this passage. That you may receive her, how? In the Lord. What does that mean? You may receive her. Some translations say that you may welcome her or greet her in the Lord. Is, is, is that just thrown in because he's trying to make this book longer, this letter longer? I don't think so. Or is there meaning in this? I think what he's saying is that, that it is because of her relationship. This is, he, he wants to help you, them understand this is Phoebe, our sister. And she has, we have a relationship together. And that relationship, as he classifies it, it's in the Lord. So treat her in a way that's respectful of this relationship. Everything we do for each other, folks, in terms, of, in terms of our relationship is because we're in the Lord. We, we, we have, each of us have committed ourselves to saying, he, he is Lord of my life. And if He's Lord of my life, and we all share that together, then, then that, that builds a relationship with each other that, that maybe we don't understand. But, but a lot of times, I think what Paul says is, we're going to see it here in, in further on down in Romans 16. He's saying, no, that in the Lord's critical. Because you, you, all of you together acknowledge who Jesus Christ really is, that He is God and that He's Lord of your life. The prepositions may change, but the prepositional phrases don't. I want you to look at these passages later on in the same chapter. Greet Herodian, my countrymen. Greet those who are of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa who have labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved Persis who labored much in the Lord. Greet Rufus chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. You see all that? I mean, every one of those is either followed, it's either preceded, or after it says it's in the Lord or with the Lord or a part of the Lord. You see all that? I mean, what, what Paul is doing, he's, he's saying, relationship that we enjoy. And it all has to do with us saying, He is Lord of my life. He's ruling my life. And even in chapter 16, He, he changes gears. But He changes gear to, to, I think, offset this relationship and say, there's some who are not going to do this. Because in verse 17, He says, Now I urge you, brethren, Note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learn and avoid them. For those who are such do not, they do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ. But they serve their own belly and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Those who are in the Lord serve the Lord. He said there are going to be some. They don't do that. They don't do that. And they deceive themselves. They're individuals driven by their own desires. And they don't serve the Lord. Well, what's the point of that? What, what, why, do you, why do you think he's saying all that? I think he's saying that because motivation matters. Because in the Lord matters, but, but why you're doing what you're doing matters. They, they were serving according to their own desires. That's not what was going on with Phoebe. That's not what was going on with those other people mentioned in 11, 12, and 13. Those were folks whose motivation were serious about serving the Lord and letting Him be the Lord of their life. Is Jesus Lord for you? Or are you Lord for you? Are you, are you your own kurios? I'll tell you how you can decide that. The way you determine whether or not you're curious in your own life is, is whose will do you obey? Are you, are you obeying the Lord's will? Are you, follow, are you allowing Him to rule over your life? Or are you ruling over your life? That's pretty simple. Does the Lord control you or do you control you? Make one final point. This is an important point. Jesus' lordship is limited for now. I want, I, want to, I want to explain to you what I mean by that. Jesus' lordship is limited. It's not limited intellectually, okay? Don't misunderstand me. But practically, it's limited. 
And the reason that I know it's limited is because the only place that Jesus has not chosen to extend his absolute dominion is over your free will. You realize that? He didn't make you do it. The, the, the Lord, listen, the Lord of heaven and earth does not make you honor him. The way, not, the way he, he, not the way he should be honored. He doesn't make you do it. In fact, he says, you can live your life wherever how you choose. That's your choice. That's part of human will. That's part of the human experience. We'll all have a choice. So for now, in essence, his lordship is limited practically. Now, spiritually, it's not limited. We know that he, he, the fact that he is Lord of heaven and earth has nothing to do with whether or not you allow him to be Lord of your life. He is Lord of heaven and earth. But you choose now as to whether or not he'll be Lord of your life. You choose that. Remember that Philippians 2 passage? Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. When every knee bows and every tongue will confess, Jesus' lordship will not be limited. It will be, it will be exercised in the fullest extent. I have thought about what, a, what an all-out confession of lordship of Jesus is going to look like, haven't you? I don't know if it will be some collective group and, and, and everybody who has ever lived somehow acknowledging the fact that ultimately, yes, Lord, I was wrong. You are Lord of heaven and earth. I don't know if it will be some sort of collective thing. I don't know if it will be some individual thing that, that nobody else will acknowledge, nobody else will see. But I will tell you this. Every tongue will confess. And every knee will bow. That Jesus is curious. No one else. So this passage which Jason read for us as we began our lesson this morning makes clear, to me it just, it just brings it all home. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you've crucified both curious and Christ. And now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter and the apostles said to them, You need to repent and you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. On that day in Jerusalem, over 2,000 years ago when the gospel was first preached, for those 3,000 people to say to Peter and the apostles, that's me. I'm confessing him right now that he's Lord of my life. For them to do that on that occasion, folks, would have taken something that I'm not sure we could even understand. We still are asked to make the same confession, but for them to acknowledge on that occasion that it was Jesus Christ, this no name, for them to acknowledge that and to accept what the apostles were preaching and for them to be baptized as we find happened in Acts 2, it, it was a decision that I'm not sure we can even understand. But it's a decision that we're asked to make. You're asked to make it today. And I want to say to you about that decision that you make it today. You don't have to make it. You don't ever have to make it. You, you, you can live the rest of your life and never make it. But one day you're going to make it. You need to make it now. You don't need to wait to profess that Jesus is curious. That he is Lord of heaven and earth and he is Lord of your life. Don't you want to do that? I want to tell you, I want to confess something to you. This is why I love to preach. Because I get to share with people the fact that you can make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. All of, you, all of us can do that. But I'm going to tell you what, just the fact that I'm standing before you this morning in front of all of you and I can say that to you. 
That sends chills up and down my spine. Jesus Christ is curious. And if you'll decide today to allow Him to be that in your life, it will be the best thing you've ever done. And it'll save you. It'll save you. So please, as we sing this song, be encouraged to respond to the gospel if that's what you need to do this morning. By 